Um, first locust event of the year here in northeastern Washington. Malachi 316 says, They that fear the Lord speak often one to another. Uh, World Church Affirmation Sabbath, otherwise known as Locus, is a place where the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church get together often to speak one to another. We cry for the unity in our church, the unity that Jesus prayed for that should exist in this church. We believe that this unity is realized only when we surrender our will to Jesus and be willing to go and be crucified with him. Just as Jesus prayed for the unity among his people, then went on the cross that his prayer may be answered. Shortly after 1844, there was great confusion and the majority of uh, people in the church were strongly opposed to any kind of organizations in the church, holding that it was inconsistent with the perfect liberty of the gospel. From early on, Mrs. White insisted on organization in the church to prevent confusion. She says in early writing, page 97, The Lord has shown that gospel order has been too much feared and neglected. Formality should be shunned, but in so doing, order should not be neglected. There is order in heaven, there was order in the church when Christ was upon the earth. And after his departure, order was strictly observed among his apostles. And now, in these last days, while God is bringing his children into the unity of the faith, there is more real need of order than ever before. For as God unites his children, Satan and, and his uh, evil angels are very busy to prevent this unity and to destroy it. She further says in early writing, page 100, I saw that this door at which the enemy comes in to perplex and trouble the flock can be shut. I inquired of the angel how it could be closed. He said, the church must flee to God's word and become established upon gospel order, which has been overlooked and neglected. With these thoughts as uh, our springboard, we plan our presentations for today's gathering. Our first topic is Wheat and Tares, and is presented by Sister Gwen Schwarber. Sister Gwen Schwarber was formerly a fashion model, an R&B artist, an actress, and a Kansas City chief, uh, chief's uh, cheerleader. Now she is a medical missionary and the author and director of Homeward Publishing Ministry. Since surrendering her life to Christ, Sister Schwarber says that uh, this part of her life has been the most rewarding as she sees souls being built up in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is her desire to be used in every way possible and to be prepared to stand at the imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sister Gwen Schwarter. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Yes. yes. You can hear me? <laughs> okay. So, I want to thank Brother A.G. for that kind introduction and also for suggesting the subject to me, Wheat and Tears. And we're going to delve into this uh, very deeply, not too deeply, but I take this opportunity to speak to you uh, very seriously. It's always serious to stand before God's people, amen? And so, um, I want to present the subject. I have a little bit too much echo. Okay, that seems to be better, thank you. So in this brief half hour that we have together, I would like to discuss with you only three points in the form of questions to you, and then one very salient question at the end, which I think each one of us should find a very good self-examination. And the first point is, what is a wheat and a tear? How do they coexist, number two, in the same field or church? And the third point is, when will they separate and what will precipitate the separation? And my last point and question I think is the most important. Which one are you? Are you a wheat or a tear? And I think by the time we finish this presentation, you'll have a very good idea where you're, you're headed spiritually and what God can do in and through you to make sure you're among the sealed and that you are meat. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this opportunity that we have to share for a few minutes. I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak in a special way and that you will convict and convince us of sin, that we will have the appearance, we will have the experience of repentance, reformation, and revival. Lord, we need you so badly in our lives. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to be manifested in this room this afternoon. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. amen. So, let's get started. We only have a few minutes. I'm going to speak basically from Matthew 13, 34 to 30, 24 to 30, and 37 to 43. And the first five books of Christ's Object Lessons, as well as Great Controversy, and some other scriptures will be my references. Since I have, as the pastor said this morning, probably enough for an hour and a half, I'm going to have to skip over some. But anyway, we'll see how it goes. So what is a tear? Have you ever thought about that? What is a tear? Well, first of all, who sowed the tears? The enemy, better known as the devil, Satan. And the tares are the children of the wicked, also described as the bad seed, the evil seed, the fruit of Satan's sowing, the embodiment of error. Tares resemble wheat. Could you separate the wheat from the tares here this morning? Would you know who was a wheat and who was a tear? No, none of us do. Because in the winter, we all look like, um, well, in the summer, we all look like evergreens. Is that right? But in the summer, you can tell the, which trees are evergreens and which ones are not. Is that true? It's the same with wheat and tares. Tares are those in the church who bear Christ's name but deny his character. Tares dishonor God. They pretend to be believers but are not. <laughs> Salvation is misrepresented and souls are imperiled by tares. Tares are false brethren, unworthy members, they're worldly and worldly minded. The wicked shall do wickedly, and not the wicked shall understand. They never understand. You can talk about Christ's righteousness, about the most holy place, about reformation, about revival, they just don't get it. 
The tears are lukewarm. They're neither hot nor cold. They are satisfied in their condition and they have need of nothing. They cannot see how miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and naked they really are. And they have no faith and no righteousness of Christ. And they don't know how to receive it. And so they are naked spiritually as well. Tares have no spiritual discernment. Have you ever spoken to someone, you ask them, you state uh, something about what we believe, and they'll say, what did you say? I don't understand that. They've been in the church for years, but they haven't studied. They are the foolish virgins. They do not accept God's message of love and rebuke. And they will not be chastened by the Lord, nor repent. The tares say, repent of what? They will not open the door of the heart to let Jesus come in. So they will not be among the overcomers that sit down with him in his throne. Finally, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. That's Matthew 13, 40. And many of them that sleep in the dust shall awake to everlasting shame and contempt. That is found in Daniel 12, 1. The field, said Christ, is the world. We must understand this, quote, as signifying the church of Christ in the world. It is in the church that we are to grow and ripen for the garner of God. That's Christ Optic Lessons, page uh, 222, and that's the ASI edition. As we have this statement from the pen of inspiration, the Laodicean message is full of encouragement and love, and yet a backslidden church may yet buy the gold of faith and love, yet have the white robe of righteousness of Christ, and the shame of their nakedness need not appear. Purity of heart, purity of motive may characterize those who are half-hearted and who are striving to serve God and mammon. And they may wash their robes of character and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. That is found in 7 Bible Commentary 966. And Let's consider the wheat now. The wheat is the good seed sown by the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They are children of God's kingdom, also called the precious grain. And they are the true followers of Christ in the world. The wheat are born again by the word of God. They believe the promises. They're not idle tales. They are those that serve God. They are the overcomers. And they overcame him by, by the blood of the Lamb and by what? The word of their testimony. And they what? Love not their lives unto the devil. They are righteous by God's righteousness. And Christ's representatives in the world for the salvation of other souls. They have accepted the rebuke of the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of their sins and are revived and reformed. They are hot, zealous for the truth and the honor of God. They see their sins. They're not blinded to them. You know, Laodicea cannot see. Did you know that? That is why they do not repent. And in the book, Reaping the Whirlwind by Joe Cruz, he says, the reason why we cannot repent is because as Adventists, we do not delineate what sin is. We define it in glittering generalities. Well, if you have those books, Creeping Compromise and Reaping the World, and actually I am now the sole director slash owner of the copyright for those books. Listen, if you can't afford them, I'll give them to you. It's the book needed for these times. Do you agree? Amen. And so, they repent of their sins and are revived and reformed. 
They are hot and zealous for the truth and the honor of God. And they pray without ceasing. Constant, continuing prayer and watch unto the same with thanksgiving. The wheat are the five virgins. They are the one taken. They are those who endure to the end. They are the elect. And their faces will shine with the brightness of the firmament. And they will turn many to righteousness. They are wise. They are purified. They are tried. And they are made white. And they understand the process. What process? They follow the Lamb into the most holy place of the sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary. And cooperate with Him in the investigation and cleansing of their soul temple. And the wicked do not understand and do wickedly. Now, they are also the third Elijah. Who's the first Elijah? Elijah the Tishbite. Who's the second Elijah? John the Baptist. Who's the third Elijah? We are. The wheat are the third Elijah who give the third angel's message to the world and the straight testimony to the church. Did you know that? There was that division. The straight testimony comes to the church first, given by the wheat. They have been sifted. There's coming a sifting, brothers and sisters. There is no unity now. But when the latter rain is poured out, there will be unity. And God's Third Elijah is going to give a straight testimony to the church and also the third angel's message to the world. They most likely will be called fanatic, extremist, judgmental, critical, unloving, and maybe the fringe. That means not the mainstream. Why would they be called the fringe? Was Elijah the fringe? Or was he part of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? No. He was. Was well, John the Baptist on the fringe? They had to come out of the wilderness to see him. So, listen to this statement. Anciently, when Elijah was sent out with a message from God to the people, they did not heed the warning. They thought him unnecessarily severe. They even thought that he must have lost his senses because he denounced them as the favored people of God. As sinners and their and as sinners and their crimes so aggravated that the judgment of God would be awakened against them. So Satan and his hopes have ever been arrayed against those who bear the message of warning and who reprove sins. The unconsecrated will also be united with the adversary of souls to make the work of God's people so hard, hard as possible. 3T 261. This is from early writings, page 118. I then saw the third angel. And I said to my accompanying angel, fearful is his work. Awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to separate the wheat from the tares. And seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. May I suggest as a people, we need, we must, it would be to our advantage to read the testimonies. Then we would find unity. How do they coexist in the same garden? First of all, Christ's servants are grieved as they see the true and the false believers mingled in the church. They long to do something to cleanse the church. But you know what Christ says? He says, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye also root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. What's the harvest? According to Ellen G. White in Christ Optic Lessons, the harvest is the end of probationary time. The Redeemer does not want to lose one soul. Every soul is precious in his sight. Now, how are the wheat and tares separated? Well, there are several meth methods they use. Thrashing, winnowing, beating, 
when it comes to people, is very painful. Why is that? Because everything that's impure, not right, coarse, has to be sifted out. And God's people will be shaken and sifted. Actually, the spirit of prophecy uses these terms synonymously. First of all, our condition as a people is described by Jesus himself. He says we're Laodicean, we're lukewarm, and he says we are, what does he say? Lukewarm? Uh, what is his remedy for us? For our miserable, wretched condition, he says we're poor, blind, and naked, but he offers a divine remedy for our fatal condition. I sat for our blindness, white raiment for our nakedness, and gold for our poverty. What is God saying to us here? That no one, no one, no one needs to stay in a lay of the sea and stay. Okay, so Jesus is the true witness. And he says, as many as I, what's the next word? Love. love. He loves us. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't tell us these things. When a parent gives correction to a child, it's out of what? Love. And so, brothers and sisters, Jesus gives us a chastening message out of love. And he says, be zealous, which means... Okay, you're, you're, you're going to like this, I think. Or maybe you won't. <laughs> Jesus says, I want you to be passionate, enthusiastic. I've had people said to me, they've said to me before, oh, I love your zeal. There's only one thing or one person that gives me zeal. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm on fire all the time. I've been a Christian. I was baptized in 1970. That's going to make me look old, but it's okay because I have never dampened my intensity, my enthusiasm, my zeal for the Lord and for His church and His truth. I'm the daughter of a Methodist minister. I came out of all those worldly things. And guess what? I know what it means to be zealous firsthand. First of all, to be zealous, you have to be a fanatic. Where do we get the word fan from? Fanatic. I used to be a fanatic for the Kansas City Chiefs, a sports. How many of you men know what team won in the Super Bowl? Raise your hand. No, don't do that. <laughs> okay. It did nothing to my family. They knew I was a Kansas City Chiefs cheerleader, but all of a sudden this year, mommy, the Chiefs won. Won what? I'm sorry. I'm not following the Chiefs anymore. And I got a call from one of the cheerleaders. I was not only the first cheerleader, but the first set of cheerleaders and the only black cheerleader that I ever knew. The first one too. But they called me and said, we're going to have a meeting and we want to do another picture of all of us together. And I said, oh Lord, tell me what to do. Because that will not work. <laughs> but here's what I'm trying to say. Is that we need to be a fanatic for Jesus. He used the word zealous. And zealous means fanatic. So we need to be zealous. Fanatic about repenting of our sins. And so. And so. Uh, as a cheerleader. Four years in high school, four years in college, and a professional cheerleader, I was really a fanatic. I followed all the sports. But when I became a true Christian of the Lord, guess what? I didn't follow it anymore. It didn't mean anything to me who was winning or who was losing. My other friend, actually my uh, niece, my cousin, sent me a picture of me with Curtis McClintock one of the chiefs way back when and I was riding on, he had broken his arm riding on his um, what do you call that? Cast. Cast. Cast, yeah. And I said, wow, Lord, you have really done something in my life. And I give him all the praise and the glory and the honor. I knew what it was to be a professional actress, dancer, singer. Five nights in a row I won at the Apollo. I knew I could speak 
But I didn't know I could sing that good. But God was preparing me for the Seventh-day Adventist church. I never heard of Seventh-day Adventists. But guess what? When you are a truth seeker, how many are truth seekers here? You love the truth no matter how many toes it steps on. Is that right? That's the way I am. You can't tell me anything I won't do for Jesus. Any inconvenience, any place he wants me to go, I will go. So, we have this testimony. The testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance and all who will receive it will obey it and be purified. That's a promise. So, is Jesus purifying you? I pray so. The urgent call is a message to cry aloud and spare not. To lift up our voice like a trumpet and show our people their sins. Fifth Testimony, page 62, says... The minds of many have been so darkened and confused by worldly customs. Now, how many of you grew up in this church? Or third or fourth generation? I think you people that raised your hand, you're the hardest to deal with. And I love you to death. But you're set in your ways. You won't move. <laughs> Not all, because a lot of you are here. But isn't it true in the church that many of them I had one lady say to me, I'm jealous of you because you have an experience and I don't. I just grew up in this. But you know what? Every one of us has to have an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ or we will not go through those pearly gates. So she says, the minds of many have been so darkened and confused by worldly customs, worldly practices, and worldly influences that all power to discriminate between light and darkness Truth and error seem destroyed. And I find that true. I come from the world. And I can see all the hypocrisy and the double talk and the, you know, this glaring. Seems like the ones who've been here forever, they can't see it. But if we have that eye salve that Jesus is willing to give us, can we see it? And we will be a united church. Now, there are many verses in the Bible, over 20 on the shaking. And one com commentator put it this way, God shakes us up to wake us up. God so shakes us in our world again, and his purpose is to remove those things that need to fall away so that he may use us. When we are shaken, all that remains will be that which brings glory and honor to God. The servant of the Lord says, I asked the meaning of the shaking and that, I, that I had seen and I was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. What will they do? Rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. Actually, the searching testimony of the Spirit of God, of the Spirit of God, according to our prophetess, tells us that the Spirit of God will separate those from Israel who have ever been at war with the means God has ordained to keep the corruptions out of the church. Wrongs must be called wrongs. Grievous sins must be called by their right name. 5T676. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to go into just the last little section here. And I just want to just read these out. If anybody wants references, I can give them to you later. We are now in the shaking. And 1 and 20 are prepared to close their earthly test their earthly history and would be verily without hope in the world as a common sinner. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. In the last solemn work, few great men 
will be engaged. Read the testimonies. Read the testimonies. Read the testimonies. Read the testimonies. In the testimonies, you will see how far as a church we are from God's ideal for his people. And when you go through the testimonies, you will see how many times she refers to those who are really ready as few. We think as Adventists we're going to blast off for heaven. We're not going to blast off for heaven, brothers and sisters, if we are not saved in God's appointed way. And that is delineated so beautifully in the testimonies. Don't raise your hand. How many of you read the testimonies? Okay, you can raise your hand. Oh, wow. This is an unusual group. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to give you, just in closing, uh, several statements that will let you know if you're a weed or tear. First of all, the seal of the living God. Can you get the seal without keeping the Sabbath? No, you can't. She says the seal, seal of the living God will be placed only upon those who conscientiously keep the Sabbath of the Lord. If you're not keeping the Sabbath now, you're not going to keep it later. Pause, let that one sink in. Not only what you think and what you say, but where you go, what you do. Second clue, those who have yielded step by step to worldly demands and conform to worldly customs will then, when is then, when the Sunday law passes, will then yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. Clue number three, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through the obedience to the truth. The pastor read us a beautiful text this morning in John 17, verse 18, I think, where he said Jesus was sanctifying himself in order that we might be sanctified. So, it says here, those who have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And, they, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Fourth clue. Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and are preparing for the mark of the beast. When it says worldly, that means lifestyle. How you eat, how you dress, where you go, what you listen to. What do you do in your leisure time? That's what that means. Number five, the storm is coming. The storm that will try men's faith of what sort it is. Believers must now be firmly rooted in Christ or else they will be led astray by some phase of error. And this is the most important point. And, well, let me get to this one first, the health message. The health message was given to prepare us for the coming of the Lord. Now, if you're not practicing health reform, you're not serious about preparing for the coming of the Lord. Is that right? Is that what that's saying? That's exactly what it's saying. We need to put counsels on diets and foods right by our bed. Read it and practice it. And you will see your mind clear, become so clear. When the Lord says go right, you won't go left. You won't have to ask anybody, oh, I have this problem. I don't know what to do about this. It will be clear because your mind is clear, made clear by the health reform message. I was sick. At 22, before I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm 72 now, I am strong as a horse. And it's because of this Adventist health message. And I have no sickness and no doctor. Okay. This is my most important. Am I okay, Brother A.G.? Okay. <laughs> the defense against evil is the indwelling in the heart through faith in his righteousness. Unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never, never, never 
resist the unhallowed effects of self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. We may leave off many bad habits for the time. We may part company with Satan, but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of ourselves to Him, moment by moment, we shall be overcome. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion, we are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding at last. That's scary, isn't it? Yes, it is. Brothers and sisters, we are living in serious times. Serious, serious times. And I pray that the Lord God of heaven will not only revive us, but reform us. It is by the mighty agency of the scriptures that the character is transformed. And it is through obedience, not disobedience, that we shall be found perfect even as he is because as we surrender he lives his perfect life in us all we have to do is make a decision everything else will fall off the trouble is it's not falling off and you're saying you're in christ so people are confused when they come to church okay may the lord be with you keep you and bless you until we meet again. May we be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and may we be determined to be among that those people that walk through the pearly gates. I want to share with you before I finish about preparation for the final crisis. It's an event that's coming up in April 15 to 17. There will be free medical missionary training. Uh, some of the speakers, if you didn't get this, you can raise your hand um, now, perhaps, and people will um, make sure you get a flyer. But brothers and sisters, we need to prepare for this event. It's medical missionary training, a return, because we have gone away to biblical standards and medical missionary training. So, and last day events. And you can see who our speakers are, are on there. This will be at the Haven Lake Church. May the Lord bless you. And thank you again, Brother A.G. Manami, for inviting me. May the Lord bless you.